Um, Anders is a senior research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute at University of Oxford. His research at the cent um, Centers of Management of Low Probability, High Impact Risks, Societal and Ethical Issues Surrounding Human Enhancement, Estimating the Capabilities of Future Technologies, and Very Long Range Futures. In addition, he is research associate on the Oxford Hero Center for Practical Ethics, the Center for the Study of Bioethics, and researcher at the Mimir Center for Long-Term Futures. Topics of particular interest include global catastrophic risk, existential risk, cognitive enhancement, collective intelligence, neuroethics, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, physical eschatology, these are some very fascinating topics, and public policy. Like this? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, as a brief entertainment, I can mention that I have a photo library of famous academics in Oxford trying to get the laptops working before their very important lectures. Uh, this always happens. And of course, as we all know it, it's much more likely to happen if we're talking about something high-tech and futuristic. If I were talking about plastic recycling, no doubt this presentation would work perfectly well. But, that was that. Now we're in the future. Now the laptop actually works. And thank you so much for that. Yeah, you saved me. Cool. So it's so nice <clears throat> to be back here again after 25 years. Of course, again, and uh, I've been in the Netherlands a lot in between. I've been to a lot of transmissions. But I do think that there is something amazing about having a bunch of people interested in the future, sitting in a cellar near a canal uh, in the Netherlands, and thinking about where are we going to go from that. Thanks. So I'm from the Future Humanity Institute. I'm also from the Mimir Center for Long-Term Futures, which is a little backup copy or offshoot I started over in Stockholm at the Institute for Future Studies. And I'm at the AI Objectives Institute, which is uh, trying to figure out how to make AI and markets have the right objectives. And uh, I'm on the border for Allfed, which is the alliance to feed everybody on Earth in the case of disasters. And then, of course, I used to be the chairman of the Swedish Transhumanist Association. And uh, I've been involved with the Extropy Institute and World Transhumanist Association. <clears throat> so I've been around a lot of time. So generally, this is going to be a middle-aged man stroking his virtual white beard, talking about, in my day, this is what we did. You youngsters don't know how good you have it. Or, or rather, actually, it's kind of awesome to be in the future where things are much better than the 1990s. So these memories, and this is, of course, the point where it's kind of appropriate to reminisce uh, about uh, transmission. Uh, one of the organizers said, this is going to be a birthday party. And he meant that as a kind of informal thing. So let's just get together, have some drinks together and chat and see what happens. But of course, it was also a birthday party for transmission conferences. It was very, very successful. Uh, I'm just annoyed uh, at the fact that I didn't uh, find any photos I took. Uh, some of the emails going back there are also pretty hilarious. And this is one of the invitations saying that um, all, all, more than 23 people are going to come. That is kind of telling how we didn't have high ambitions back then. We have filled up much bigger venues, uh, like the transmission in Chicago that used the Natural History Museum. And, and of course, the trans transmission movement came out from the mailing lists that already existed at the time. And those mailing lists in the 1990s were the backbone of how much of the transhumanism got shaped. They were shaped very much by the Extropy Institute mailing list, which is still up and running, but uh, I think its glory days were very much in the mid-90s when it really got together people. And then we can, of course, trace the ideas much further back. Uh, Extropy Institute has ante antecedents. We can go back all the way to H.G. Wells and deeper. We can trace how ideas have influenced various thinkers in all sorts of interesting ways, and how they have evolved and affected different groups. Similarly, the transmission uh, conferences also have moved forward. Over at the London conference, and that's where we were sitting out in a little garden thinking about maybe we should form some World Transhumanist Association. And uh, yeah, that worked. That became Humanity Plus. Um, and there have been many of these interesting spin-offs. 
Uh, but when I'm musing and thinking about this, I'm also noticing that it's surprisingly hard to find actually good photos and documentation. One reason was this was back in the dark ages of the 1990s where we didn't have quite as good phones and cameras. Uh, you actually had to write things. You couldn't just speak it into a computer, get a transcript. But we were probably worse than we should have been at documenting what, we, what we're doing. We should probably actually aim at leaving bigger paper trails. Because I think historians, when they look back on this era, they really think this has been important. And I'm not just saying this is a nice hand wave, a rhetorical way to convince you all that, oh yes, um, we're at a historical moment right now. No, I had a literal historian in the office next to mine in Oxford who was researching the history of transhumanism. She was literally writing papers about what we said on the mailing list. She didn't allow me to throw out papers from my office. She was my personal recycler just to check that uh, I didn't throw away anything important. And of course, it was very annoying to her if I said, oh yes, we had that conversation, but I can't find the emails. They're probably on that server that went down in 97. That was annoying. So the end result is a little footnote, Andrew Sandberg, personal communication. That, that's the level of evidence we end up with. And I do think that we should think in the future about trying to record and document as much as we can. Uh, some of us might say, oh, that's great, we can feed it into the AI or we can use it to, to uh, fine tune our brain emulations. But I also think it's important just to be careful with ideas. Ideas are valuable things. Discussions have value and we want to document them, get as much context and metadata about them as we can. Then, of course, another interesting question is what has happened <coughs> since that first transition? And I'm very happy to say that we're parents. Our movement has kind of become uh, apparent to a whole bunch of other things. Some of them are movements, some of them are concepts or ideas. But I think it's very interesting to trace this effect. Uh, so, one of the things that was going on on the mailing list were some enthusiasts saying, yeah, singularity is coming, we need to speed it up, we need to make sure it happens fast because the world is crap and we had it with it, so if we just make super intelligent self-improving AI, then everything will be totally fine. And this being a 1990s mailing list, of course, people were calling out on it and debating this rather intensely. And eventually, the, the Eliezer, who was the leader of this group of extropian lists, started to realize, yeah, actually, I want to build a god. Maybe it should not be the god of my fathers. Maybe I should make sure it's friendly. Okay, how hard can it be to make a friendly superintelligence? I'll be right back. And that led to him realizing that, oh, actually, there is an interesting, juicy problem here. If you have something that might be self-transforming, self-improving, how do you make it behave itself? How do you actually stabilize that? Oh, that leads to some very deep questions and eventually led to very much of what we today call AI safety research. In the process, uh, Eliezer and his friends realized, oh, this, these things are hard. It's hard to reason about something that's much more intelligent than we are. And a lot of the standard arguments people are bringing up are stupid. Maybe we should become less stupid. So we got the rationalist movement. Basically, let's try to figure out ways of thinking better. So, when we talk about um, improving thinking, quite often from a transhumanist context, we start talking about smart drugs, which started talking about can we fix the brain. But obviously, we are also fixing the brain just by learning logic. We're fixing brain by education. We're fixing brains by learning Bayesian reasoning and the other forms of mental techniques that are actually quite powerful because we can do them right now, we can measure their effects, we can investigate what makes for better and worse forms of reason. And that led to the rationalist movement. They are an interesting group because they, together with us, have influenced some of the other ones here. Another interesting side effect of being a transhumanist is that you think that the future could become radically better in various dimensions. Not just one dimension. It's not just that we live longer in the future. Most people accept that if life extension goes well, we're also going to have a radically different future in other respects too. But once you start taking a radically different future seriously, you also have to recognize that, oh, it could be radically worse too. 
if you don't accept that, then you have a very weird view of the world. You say, these technologies are going to transform the world and they can never ever fail. That's a little bit like the crystal healer who insists that if you just buy all the crystals in their store, everything is going to go wet, better for you. There can't possibly be any side effects of this. That's usually how you can tell something is pseudoscience. There can't possibly be any side effect of it. Of course we can. Anything that has an effect on the world can be used badly or have an effect you don't recognize. So that led to the emergence of thinking about existential risk. Indeed, I was on my way to the transition 2003 in, in New Haven uh, at Yale University when I first read Nick Bostrom's paper on existential risk and I hated it. I felt like this is going to be used by those Luddite anti-transhumanists to argue that that's why we need to slow down technological development. Look how dangerous they are. And I felt like I really need to talk to Nick about this is a stupid paper. The funny thing is over the years, uh, kind of come around to realize, mm, actually it's a rather relevant paper. The paper itself is not super great. The sequel is actually much better. But he makes a very important point. If humanity goes extinct, or something equivalently bad, we can't redo things. That means that we could lose all the future. That's tremendously important. And over the years since, there had emerged a very interesting community working on global catastrophic and existential risks. Not all members of that community are transhumanists. Indeed, many of them are very skeptical of transhumanism. But it's very telling how many transhumanists were part of founding it and getting it going. And, and of course, this is closely tied to what we do. I'm using our own institute, the Future Humanities, as an example. But there is a whole bunch of research institutes in academia studying questions closely related to transhumanism. <laughs> some of them studying transhumanism directly, some of them looking at transhumanist questions like we do. And that has also been born a lot of interesting fruit. Perhaps the weirdest and most interesting thing that happened was the effective altruism movement. So that kind of began in the office next to mine. So philosophy students were having tutorials about Peter Singer's ethics and realized that, yeah, his argument for why we should give away the money we don't need to help the global poor is totally valid. It's a good idea. Why don't we actually do it? And these were unusual philosophy students that actually went and did it. And then they realized that actually every person we convince that this is a good argument, maybe it's not that many people, but it still makes things better. Hmm, let's try that. Actually, where should we give the money? Well, we could give it to some random charity, but different charities are differently good. Hmm, which ones actually produce the most good per dollar? Let's investigate that. And they found some ways of comparing that, at least in some domains. It's somewhat doable when you think about healthcare. It's much less tricky, it's much more tricky in the other domains. But at least when it comes to health, you can see that certain interventions can be literally thousands of times more effective than other interventions. Prevention, for example, is typically much cheaper than a cure. So if you focus on preventing something bad, it's much better. So that then led to setting up an organization, helping people give away money they didn't need, an organization for evaluating charities. And then it grew into this movement, the effective altruist movement, that has branched out and become very interesting, and in recent days somewhat controversial. But the most interesting thing here is in many ways, they are the same people as us. In fact, there is a fair bit of overlap. Indeed, many people who back in the 90s would have become transhumanists and been at the Transition Conference today end up at the Effective Altruism Global Conference. There is also a lot of lively conversation about human enhancement and whether that is a cost-effective way of improving the world, etc. I'm very happy to be part of it. So, the interesting thing about the effective altruism movement is that in some sense the, that uh, the youngster in the family that uh, takes up a job and starts earning more than uh, the, his dad and the dad is both a bit proud and a bit annoyed at that fact. Uh, all that tension is going to that kid. What is he actually doing? And uh, I would generally say a lot of good actually. It's literally saving a lot of lives. It's doing a lot of good stuff in many forms that are totally mundane. Malaria bed nets, uh, anti-worm therapy, investigations in how to fix uh, global poverty, but also investing in research against existential risk, a lot into AI safety, thinking about how do we make safer biotechnologies or new forms of resource organizations that can come up with ideas outside academia, because let's face it, academia is pretty stuffy and not too keen on two new ideas. 
Another thing we discussed a lot in the 90s were in the digital currencies and encryption. The basic idea was so as eventually we will just come up with a digital currency and it's going to be so good everybody is going to convert the money to that, the governments can't tax it and then the libertarian utopia ensues. It's gonna go great. And nothing happened. Because it turned out that actually there are complications of making a digital currency that works. It's even harder if people don't care. But eventually, in circles kind of linked to transhumanism, the, the Bitcoin showed up. And that generated a lot of stuff. I'm gonna come back to that a bit later, but I think it's an interesting case to see this is adjacent, it's somewhat related. It made some uh, people in transhumanism surprisingly rich, and it also caused all sorts of weird headaches, showing that just because you think a technology might have certain effects, doesn't mean it will have that. Not even when you try to design it with particular uh, uh, aims in it. Another technology we discussed a lot back in the 90s were prediction marks. Here I'm just using Manifold as logo as an example. The idea, <coughs> the idea that you can get people to together when, uh, uh, kind of bet on future things to improve forecasts. And that was an idea we were talking a lot about and implementing early forms. Today they exist. There's still not the full version because of various American rules and on gambling. You can't actually use real money, which would probably improve performance, but we've shown that it worked really well. And a related idea, super forecast, had turned out to be a surprisingly good improvement in our ability to forecast. Now, where am I going with this? Well, generally it seems like we have a lot of progress here in terms of actually inspiring people. Getting people to take some package of ideas and develop them further. And we quite often have rather good relationships with these uh, groups. Uh, but it's also an interesting question what we should be doing here. So that's something I want to leave you with uh, from this slide. Okay, what should we do? Should we just be the proud parents wondering what the kids are up to? Or is, do, are we going to say, no, no, we will still want to be relevant. We're, it's super important that transhumanism is still part of this slide and even 10, 50 years in the future. What are we actually trying to do? And I think that gets to the question, what is a movement? Is it about the, our friendships? Is it about having a group that gives it uh, the members mutual support? Might it be that, oh, it's just about the ideas or is it about creating social changes of various kinds? Okay, I'm going to continue onward here because I'm obviously always going to run out of time here. Uh, Okay, okay, then it's going to be really far, yeah. Uh, so, one of the interesting things looking back at this maybe is we made a lot of predictions. Were we any good at it? And the answer is no. It's kind of interesting to recognize how bad we are at making predictions. We shouldn't feel bad because people are bad at predictions. Just because you're interested in the future doesn't mean you're good at predicting what is going to happen in the future. But foresight is more than making predictions. Uh, you also might want to find decision-relevant information. You might want to show leadership, or you might want to have visions. And generally, it seems like uh, our ability to predict, for example, consequences of something like a cryptocurrency, that's rather uh, low. But we seem to be much better at observing technologies that actually did matter quite often long before the mainstream people, or even mainstream academia, recognize them as being very relevant. Uh, have we shown leadership? And, uh, I think to some degree, yes. And uh, I think we also have actually done some useful visioneering that has actually affected it. Again, getting back to Natasha's uh, comments here about uh, uh, is uh, Silicon Valley being run by transhumanists? Yeah, I think we influenced them. I think uh, we honestly can say that a whole bunch of uh, tech uh, leadership and uh, other people have been influenced by it. <coughs> this is both good and bad. It's great that you have the powerful people that agree with some of your views. It's horrifying when they do other stupid things. It's also important to recognize that outside Silicon Valley, transhumanist ideas show up in many other forms, uh, but we rarely talk about that. Uh, the really interesting part here is, of course, what well, can we do something smarter about this? Uh, and generally, are we in this uh, transhumanist uh, future? Well, we got a lot of AI that is doing amazing things. Uh, we're all carrying around really awesome wearable devices. Uh, really awesome wearable devices, yes. And, uh, we have those darn cryptocurrencies. Uh, and yes, and we have new space. And a whole lot, a long list of things we were debating is actually coming to fruition. We were very bad at predicting their timing. 
That's unsurprising. You tend to overestimate how fast things can go short term and underestimate it long term. And now, the really interesting thing is there are other technologies that are kind of in wings that seem to be coming ever closer. But again, short term versus long term, it's unclear, even if fusion goes really well, how many decades it takes before it actually solves energy problems. Quantum computing, again, anybody's guess. Uh, us who are working at the whole brain emulation, we're optimistic, but in a decade now, it's gonna take a long while there. And the interesting thing here is, of course, that our prediction ability is not important, but our ability to kind of go out and get jobs, start companies or do research has actually shown uh, quite a lot of influence on making this transhuman future happen. And uh, that gets to perhaps my main point. So in Greek uh, in the mythology or concepts of time, there are two or three different ideas of what time is. There is chronos, father time, linear time that you measure with your hourglass. And then there is kairos, opportunistic time, the right moment. Just when something happens, you do the right thing. There is also an, uh, another one representing eternity, but uh, he's uh, not relevant right now. The interesting thing here about Kronos and Kairos is, of course, we should be trying to think about where we can use Kairos. We think ahead. We try to have foresight. We try to show leadership. We try to do the sensible thing. And sometimes there is an opportunity where you can exert that influence and then you should be ready. You should feel that you are able to act and you act. This is easier said than done. It's very easy for me to be a motivational speaker. It's tricky to do. But we have demonstrated that sometimes we do step up. When Francis Fukuyama published our post-human future, uh, that was a Kairos moment for transhumanism. Here you have a, an important public intellectual writing an entire book about what why transhumanism is the worst thing ever. And we started responding. We got out of the cellar and started the uh, uh, debating in academia, in, in the newspapers, uh, in other places, and were actually really successful. We got an, uh, a lot of uh, bioethics people on our side. That uh, was important. <laughs> it added a lot of respectability to transhumanism. Sometimes your worst enemy can be very useful. There was a Kairos moment last year when ChatGPT arrived and suddenly a lot of people realized, oh, artificial general intelligence is way closer than we previously thought and man, very different groups tried to grab them. You can flub a Kairos moment. Sometimes a crisis happens and you're not ready for it. You're, you're, you're just not looking ready enough. But I think we should use our ability to think ahead and we should think about what are kind of expected moments that could happen that we should try to do. A dramatic demonstration of the longevity in a mouse. Maybe in a, some in enormous accident with AI. Maybe some interesting breakthrough in biotechnology. What do we have ready to immediately tell the journalists about that? What do, you know, do we do when we show up at the lectern to give a talk about the philosophical meaning of it? That might actually change the course of history. So, at the end here, thinking about what, well, what uh, are the key points I'm trying to make? Well, one is, is, of course, that we want to increase the chance of good stuff happening and reduce the chances of bad things happening. And in order to do that, we need this understanding of the limits of our prediction ability, but also the power of um, us influencing ideas long term, the power of foresight. The second part is, of course, well, we also want uh, to make sure that we uh, succeed with our values. And this is where I think we've been slightly less successful. At least in Western civilization, pessimism is very prevalent. It's on the rise. A lot of people think the future is dark and gloomy, and there's nothing to do about it. But we are optimists. We think the future could be glorious. We think also that we can impact the future. And that combination is important. It gives us a sense of agency, which is at the very least psychologically healthy, even if you happen to be wrong about your ability to influence the future. But even more important, it actually makes you want to go out and do something about it. But I do think we need to work more on building holistic, positive visions of the future. The future can be more than just some uh, nice cartoon of solar punk. That's nice, but we can probably do much better. And this is where we might want to make use of our network of the adjacent movements and ideas. It's not just about uh, a standard future. After all, as transhumanists, we know there are many, many possible futures, many possible post-humanities and goals. 
And I think we should be pursuing get, showing these visions, showing that they're positive. Because if there's one thing people who don't like transhumanism uh, think, it's that they have a picture of what we want that's very different from what we actually want. And we need to become much more <clears throat> clear and maybe poetic about explaining that. Thank you.